for those of you that may be relatively new members, Hank basically grew up uh, practically on Spring Island. He's a native of Buford. His parents, Glenn and Shay Warner, uh, live in Buford and bring Hank's out here uh, forever. Uh, he's in that, uh, he graduated from Buford High School at the same time with my youngest daughter. That's right. Uh, along with uh, Haynes' twin sister, who was partners in crime with my daughter. Um, <laughs> their goal was to pick on Haynes whenever possible. Um, yeah, Haynes uh, got his falconry permit when he was 15 years old wow. uh, under the tutelage of Steve Hine, who runs the Raptor Center at Georgia Southern and flies the Georgia Southern Bald Eagle. Um, Freedom. That's right. Yeah. Appropriate name. Yeah. Um, and then after four years at Wake Forest, where he earned his undergraduate degree, uh, he entered the vet school at Lincoln Memorial University, which is in Cumberland Gap, Tennessee, and he's getting ready to start his third year of vet school. So having said that, he had a, a special experience this summer, and so I asked him to come and share it. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sure. There you go. Well, well, yeah, really a bigger turnout than I was expecting. Dr. Marsh was like, yeah, there'll just be a few people. It's okay. Like, so I don't claim to be a master order um, or um, a historian on, on falconry, but I had a, an incredible summer this year. Like uh, Dr. Marsh said, I'm starting my third year of veterinary school, and I've been a falconer now for nine, at least nine years, um, and uh, have always read about the Abu Dhabi Falcon Hospital in the UAE. It's, it is one of a kind um, in its scale. There are several other Falcon hospitals, but it's enormous. And I was lucky enough to speak or to, to spend um, four weeks there doing a veterinary internship. So um, I'm going to begin with a little bit about me and my falconry. Um, like Dr. Marsh said, I pretty much grew up on Spring Island, and I was lucky enough to be able to fly my red-tailed hawk. Um, this is Vesper here on the, the far left. She's now almost 10. Um, it's incredible how <laughs> time flies. Um, but we pretty much grew up together out here on, on Spring Island, um, hunting rabbits on uh, straight road and um, star mountain fields. And there are a lot of rabbits out here. And certainly <laughs> certainly more now that we have, have moved on to, uh, to vet school. But I was lucky enough, uh, I had her all through my time at Wake Forest. Um, she actually stayed on site in the biology building, which was, um, I was just so fortunate. Um, after seven or so years of flying a red tail, I decided to um, try my hand at the goshawk, and this is Eve. Um, she's a, the goshawk in the second photo, and flew her for about a year, and um, unfortunately it just didn't work out. I spent a bit off a little more than I could chew, being an undergrad at Wake Forest. Um, a Ferrari, or a, a goshawk is essentially a, a Ferrari of the falconry world. They are a high performance bird, and I uh, just wasn't quite ready for it. Um, and wound up giving her to my sponsor, and it worked out for the best because a few years later down the road, he gave me Kate, which is the Peregrine Falcon sitting in front of us now. Um, and it was just kind of the, the golden ticket because I had just started vet school and didn't have time to be training a new bird, so it all just kind of fell in my lap, and I've um, been very fortunate um, to be able to continue my falconry uh, during uh, professional school. So um, I have, let's see, should be the next one, yes. Um, so before I get started, on, on falconry in the Arab world. Uh, I'd like to show there's a, a short video here. It's actually a trailer for an upcoming documentary on falconry across the globe, but this is an excerpt from falconry specifically in the Middle East. And a lot of this, um, or in the UAE, I should say. Um, but a lot of this footage is um, filmed in Dubai, which was uh, like two hours from, from me in Abu Dhabi. And I, I visited Dubai while I was there. Uh, so here we go. If we talk about the past, if we go like 50, 60 years, it was a survival here to live in such desert, such hunger sometime, and no water. The falcon was like a weapon to us. falcon can catch in one day like 10, 15 rabbits, if it's a good falcon. I 
I think of the falcon when they are in the wild and when they are captured and scared. I want to build the trust between us. It's a special creature really. If you look at it and the way God created this bird and the shape and, and all these nails and, and, and the speed of this bird. I've seen it sometime when it dives from the sky coming. It comes like a bullet and you hear the noise coming. And it's, it's fantastic. We release them outside in the desert. He will not fly back unless he trusts you. Once the falcon builds this trust, then he is ready to hunt. to share that trailer just because it really shows how imbued falconry is in the culture in the UAE. It's, I mean, that little girl with the jeer falcon on the handlebars of her tricycle. Like, it's just so different from, from falconry in the U.S. Um, I, could sp I could spend hours talking about the differences alone, um, and you all have to keep me on target because I, I know I'm on, on the clock here. Um, but um, in order to understand falconry, in modern falconry in the UAE, you really have to go back to, to their history. Um, so falconry is an ancient tradition. Tradition. It was born really out of necessity. Um, like the, uh, the gentleman was explaining, these, these falcons were a means of survival. Um, during the, this is such a tangential sport, I have to keep myself on target, but um, they used it as a means to supplement protein into their diet during, during um, the, the difficult months. It originated in the Middle East as early as 2500 BC, um, and we see writ written evidence 700 AD, and the, the evidence you see there is it's already a very complex sport, so they've been doing this for a long time by the time it, they even began writing it down. Um, there we go. Um, so it really emerged out of the Bedouin culture. So the Bedouins were a semi-nomadic group of um, Arabians and mm -hmm. semi-nomadic group um, that um, were mainly focused in the Arabian and Syrian deserts, and they use animals, or they use falconry to hunt animals like gazelles, which kind of blew my mind. It's like what? a small deer that these falcons are taking. Um, hare, stone cur curlew, and hubara. And hubara, the hubara buster, it's impossible to explain Arab falconry without at least touching upon the hubara. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but falconry <laughs> has always been a part of, of Bedouin culture. And it's really emerged from the Bedouins into, into the modern UAE. Uh, but it's, it was interesting. I learned that falcons don't breed in any of the Arab states. They only migrate through. And this was important because it was, falconry was really a seasonal sport. For our sport is a generous word, lifestyle um, for them over there. So they would trap these falcons as they're migrating through, right, right as the prey items, the animals that they're hunting, both for their, for their birds and for their, their families, are also migrating through. Um, and it really increased trade across Asia and, and all through the Middle East. Um, I'm really kind of throwing a blanket over um, Arabian history and with Falcon because we could, we could be here for days. Um, but so the Hubara Buster, like I said, you can't, you can't talk about Middle Eastern Falcon without at least explaining the Hubara because it is, it is their premier quarry. Mm -hmm. um, so the Hubara Buster, I like to explain, it's like kind of a cross between like a grouse and an egret. 
Um, they're very strange. I, I can't really compare them to anything that we would have, certainly on Spring Island. Um, but the Hubara also migrates through the UAE, and it was by far the most revered quarry for, for falcons. Um, the, there's a huge respect, and, and I, you see this across the, across the board in falconry, but a huge respect for, for quarry animals. And it was great to hear the Emirati falconers speaking of the Hubara, because they were talking of the strength and the power and the speed of the Hubara. And then in the next sentence, they would talk about those same adjectives with their falcons because it's just an amazing animal. And for that reason, uh, the hubara has really been overhunted, and it's in huge decline over there. Um, <laughs> this is a, a photo, those are all hubara. I know it's, it's rather small, but that's a lot of hubara. And I would see that photo as a, a hunter in the States and think, oh, somebody you know, had a great day in the duck blind. But no, I can assure you that those were all taken with falcons which kind of blew my mind to think, because it's just so different from the US, to think that falconry had led to the demise of any quarry. <laughs> it's, uh, their, their hunting style over there is so much different than it is in the States you know, with our, our method of falconry. Um, it's not uncommon for an Emirati falconer to have 200, 300 personal falcons. And they might not hunt with all of those, but when they go to hunt in, um, uh, in across the Middle East, it's a it's a huge it's a spectacle. It is they'll take um, it, they'll take several hundred falcons and fly them you know not all at once certainly but in, across several weeks. But they'll also have a mobile veterinarian, a, a cook, a doctor. They'll have it'll be a hundred people in a camp in the desert for four weeks, all to hunt kubara. Um, and it really blew my mind. And I was lucky enough as a falconer when I was over there at the um, at the hospital speaking with the techs who had accompanied several of these Emirati falconers on hunting excursions, we really bonded, we had a common bond through falconry because uh, I was different than a lot of the techs they saw over there as being a falconer myself. I could tell them, you know, I've, I've hunted, I have a falcon and I've done this. And uh, so many of the same adjectives we use to describe our birds, I would hear it in their rhetoric and it was, um, it was really interesting. But I found this, this cartoon, it's, it made me laugh. But it really emphasizes just how serious they are about the Kubar. Um, and you also can't explain UAE falconry without talking about Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan al Nadi, And he is very loved by his people. He's, he's the one who transformed the UAE into a unified and developed nation. He organized all seven of the different emirates of the UAE into one collective country. And he's he is a, an avid, or he was, he's, he's since passed, but he was an avid falconer and a strong advocate for falconry in the environment, which is very important because his legacy later led to the development of the Abu Dhabi Environmental Agency, which has since started the Abu Dhabi Falcon Hospital. It's a publicly run falcon hospital in the UAE. So he was very loved by his people and he put a strong emphasis on the environment as well as falconry in the UAE. Um, so this is actually, this is an Emirati falconer that I had the privilege, uh, he invited me to spend a weekend at his house. Um, it was a, a, an amazing cultural experience. His brother was a sultan who I was introduced to and, you know, a little kid from Buford and, like having dinner with a sultan. Um, which, uh, was, I had several times where I'd just be in the car and I'd be like, how did I get myself in this situation? Uh, but it was, it was really a privilege to see, here he is, this is um, one of his, uh, I think it's a, a Jir, um, Jir, Jir hybrid, Jir Falcon, probably Jir Saker hybrid, Saker Falcon hybrid. And uh, you can see he had a full wall of trophies that his, his Falcon had won in Falcon racing. And uh, I was, he showed me his Saluki kennel and his Falcon breeding facility and it talked to me about his family's uh, racing camels. Uh, and it was, it was just really uh, an amazing experience. But um, the UAE is, is unique in that they have the highest number of falconers per capita in the world. And something like 5,000 Emirati falconers. And that might not sound like a lot, but each of these Emirati falconers, like I said, it's not uncommon for them to have 200, 300 falcons. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think legally in the US right now, a, a master falconer such as myself, we can only have five birds. And I don't know who has time or the money in the U.S. to fly, you know, five falcons is, is you have your hands full. Um, but because of the decline of the, or because of the decline of the Hubara, um, hunting has been banned in the UAE for several decades now, and this has led to Emirati falconers 
having to travel out of country to like Sudan, uh, Morocco, Pakistan, Iran. These are big countries that they would they'll travel to for four four or five weeks in, in you know in the hunting months, which is October to March. Um, and it's a it is a spectacle. It's it's you know they'll take fifteen or twenty hubara in a day, and then the next day move somewhere else and do the same thing. So they it's not surprising that that style of falconry has led to the decline of the hubara, and it's unfortunate. But it's also led to um, stronger conservation practices over there. Um, they have things kind of analogous to Ducks Unlimited and breeding facilities. There's actually a Hubara breeding facility not too far from, from me at the Abu Dhabi Falcon Hospital. And they release something like 20,000 Hubara across the Middle East each year, um, which was just incredible. Um, here we have, uh, he was one of the falcon handlers uh, of the Sultans. Um, with some of his birds. Uh, this is a Sheer Saker hybrid and then a Peregrine. Um, in the background, much like Kate here. Um, and like I said, in the UAE, falconry is just a part of daily life. There's a falcon on every dollar bill over there, and they have beautiful money. And I was, you know, I, of course, I loved it because there's a sacred falcon um, on every bill, and it was just really amazing to, to see how central falconry is to their daily life. It's just normal for them to walk into a room and, oh, there's a falcon. But, you know, as an American, you walk in a room and there's 30 falcons, like, you need a minute to like my first the first day I was there my face just hurt from smiling because I, I didn't learn anything they wouldn't let me touch anything the first day anyhow and it was for good measure because I was just giddy looking at all these there'd be 60 falcons perched in a room and you know a, I've been doing this so long it was just such a dream come true it was pretty cool um, so since falconry has been banned or not falconry but hunting has been banned in the UAE um, they've turned to falcon racing. And I had no knowledge of this prior to my, to my trip, but falcon racing is a huge, huge deal over there. And it, it's incredible to think, I mean, these are some of the, the peregrine sitting here, Kate, um, peregrine falcon is the fastest animal on the planet. They've been clocked over 280 miles an hour. 280 miles an hour. Um, so yeah, let's race them. Um, and, uh, I, I've been reading about it. I wasn't lucky enough to, to witness any falcon races while I was there. I was there during the off season. Um, but a typical falcon race is like a 400 meter dash, and they have arm bracelets, um, little electronic tags on, on these falcons that record when they leave the glove and when they hit the lure. Um, and it, you know, some of these 400 meter dash, the winning times is something like 19 seconds. Something like that. So these falcons are moving, um, and this this racing is largely born out of their falconry style in in, in uh, the Middle East. Um, and this is where I'm going to get myself into a tangent, but I'll try and be brief. Um, so in the in the Middle East, they fly these falcons largely in pursuit style, like from the glove. So they'll be driving the deserts in their Toyotas. Everybody in the back is holding a falcon, and they're all hooded. And it's, it's amazing, and they're riding the dunes. I mean, it's, incredible dunes, sand dunes over there, and they have one falcon that is the spotter, and he's sitting up, and somebody's, his handler is just watching this, this jeer falcon, or hybrid, sitting there until it, it has seen a hubara, and they put the hood on that one, and then they will pick, you know, which bird is going to hunt, and they fly from the glove, so they're really focused on speeds from the glove in a linear flight style with these falcons, whereas in the U.S., like with my peregrine, we hunt in a style that's called waiting on, so I put Kate up, and she will circle up to 1,100, 1,000 feet. And she'll be this little speck in the sky. And it's very exciting. Um, and so I'll have her in position over a pheasant, hopefully with my, my new uh, uh, bird dog that I've been working on. Um, I'm excited about that new piece of the puzzle. But Kate will be at 1,100 feet. And then I'll send, hopefully, the dog in, because my running days, I'm, I'm excited not to be the one to do all the flushing. But I send the dog in, flush the ducks off the pond, and Kate will come down like a bullet, that's exactly, I've said that so many times, it was great to see it in the, in the video, another falcon mentioning it. Um, but you could hear them coming, and it literally sounds like a jet. They, it's, it's really a spectacle. Um, so yeah, their, their flight style is completely different over there, and uh, much different than the US, and, and that's really how falcon racing has come about. It's, it was born out of their, their hunting style. Um, so female birds are, are Hugely more popular. They uh, it's a, across the board, female birds of prey tend to be a third larger than the males, and everybody wants the big and strong, the fast, powerful female um, female falcons. And jeer falcons and jeer hybrids are the most popular. 
Um, here, these are two articles I found on, on falcon racing. Uh, it was really just interesting to see how prominent uh, it is over there. And in 2013, a white deer sold for over 1, mil, 1 million um, dirhams, which is something like 250,000 US dollars, which just it was hard to wrap my head around. Um, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, for the first week, I thought I just lost something in translation. <laughs> there's, there's no way, I need to go Google this. Um, yeah, so Falcon Racing has really made, it has brought a new life into an already very popular pastime in the UAE. Um, here, this is a video, hopefully this won't be too grainy, it's from my cell phone, I apologize, but um, I was invited to, to see the, the Falcon facility from the Sultan, and in this one room, this is his molting chamber for his personal Falcons, I asked how many, there were 102 Falcons in one oh, room. Oh my God. I was, I, I'm an avid birder and falconer. I thought I'd seen a lot of falcons, you know, more than the average person, certainly. There was 102 in one room. Um, so yeah, I was just walking around, like, just smiling. It was incredible. Um, but these are several different species. This is their, like, molting chamber. So these birds are in here just for the summer. They're, they've been fed, like, hay. She's, um, she's not in shape. She's just, you're increasing fat reserves so that they'll molt and grow new strong feathers in ready for the hunting or racing or racing season ahead. This was a little alcove where these falcons could go in and sleep for any time. You can't really see, but there's like 30 falcons in that little um, alcove. But um, it, was, it was really amazing. All these falcons are free flying. And I was concerned, I mean, are, don't they fight? You know, these birds have incredible talents and they're, they're very strong. Um, they keep them so well fed that there's really no need to. Um, so at his facility, they bred, they bred their own quail, they bred their own homing pigeons, they bred, there were so many you know, support birds for, at, at this uh, facility, and they had um, a full-time staff that s stayed at this compound that was for, for their racing falcons. It was really amazing. Um, and as I was leaving, I looked, and there was another pen, we were driving off, and there were gazelles. And we were, I was like, what are the gazelles for? And they are to train his racing Salukis, which is like an Arabian Greyhound. So uh, we could have had a lot of fun if I had been there um, <laughs> and, and during their busy season. Um, so now that you see just how popular falconry is in the UAE and in, in the Middle East, um, I, was, I wanted to, to enforce that because it, for me it was hard to understand why is there even a need for something like the Abu Dhabi Falcon Hospital. Like certainly you don't have the the clientele in the U.S. or the patient base to have any kind of facility analogous to this. Um, so now we'll turn to the Abu Dhabi Falcon Hospital. And I finally got my picture, and this was like day one. It's like, I need a picture of me in front of the, the facility. This is incredible. Uh, so that was my last day, and I, I passed my test, and I was like, can I walk out front with a, with a Jira Falcon, please, and thank you. Um, so the Abu Dhabi Falcon Hospital was established by the Environmental Agency for Abu Dhabi in 1999. Um, it's the first public veterinary hospital exclusive, exclusively for falcons in the UAE, and it's the largest in the world. Um, since they started in 1999, they've treated over 75,000 falcons, oh um, which is just a staggering number um, yeah. by any means. And they, they treat over 11,000 11, falcons each year, excuse me. <laughs> which, these are just numbers it's hard for me to wrap my head around as an oh American doctor. But during the busy season, they would see 200 falcons a day, <clears throat> which... It's just staggering. Um, but, and I was excited to see, we'd have like 30 a day. And our, I was there during Ramadan, so the, the working hours were cut short. And I was still just amazed, like 30 falcons a day, it's like more than I'd, you know, I would see in years in the US. So um, it was pretty neat. This is uh, Nasir, he was a, a technician who was very helpful to me. Um, you know, very patient with, with all of my, uh, you know, learning how to take blood and, and sampling from falcons and all of these different mm -hmm. procedures. He was a big help. Um, and he actually, we bonded, he had been on several hunting excursions as a privately uh, contracted falcon technician. So these, these guys would travel to Morocco and say, hey, will you come and take care of my falcons? And yes, it's, <laughs> please. So this is the compound. This is the Abu Dhabi Falcon hospital and um, each it's about a quarter mile by a quarter mile so this is a huge facility and I know it might be kind of hard to see this on, on Google Earth um, this is as close as I could get zoom and still have everything here but 
I'm not sure if you can see my, I'm going to use this. Um, so these are molting, these are molting chambers. I won't tap the screen, I promise, Dr. Um, these are molting chambers where you, as a falconer, as an Emirati falconer, you could bring your birds for six months and just drop them off and you pay a certain amount each month and they'll call you when your bird has completed its molt. Um, I lived here, these are apartments for uh, visiting veterinary students or technicians. Um, here was a pool. The hospital had a pool. <laughs> For you or the bird? For, for uh, um, these were all different wards that would have individual rooms for each falcon. Um, and there were, there were wards for TB birds, birds that had um, TB for smallpox. Um, it was really very well organized, clearly a multi, multi million dollar facility. Um, run by Dr. Margit Mueller, she's from Germany, and she is the leading veterinarian in avian, er, er, raptor medicine, um, and it was, uh, it was a privilege to, to work with her. Um, these were um, housing for the staff. Um, this was a mosque that they had on site, that's pretty interesting. Um, this is the main facility of the hospital, so there's an IC, a Falcon ICU, um, there was an ambulance. Falcon the ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I had several of those moments where I would just walk in a room and be like, "This is a real thing." Like, okay. Um, this is a uh, this is a the Arabian Saluki Center. So um, these racing and hunting dogs that they would bring here it was really amazing. Um, these were also molting facilities, um, and they also had a separate just your average veterinarian, cats and dogs. Um, but, but interesting nonetheless, and I actually didn't, didn't get you to um, visit that, that part of this facility. They were very strict on where you could go as a, as a um, visiting student. Uh, all right, so I think I covered everything there. Um, this is the waiting room, <laughs> which blew my mind. I, I crept out there when no one was around, but lavish. I mean, classic UAB, there's... Yeah. More money than they know what to do with, so they, they turn it into these amazing facilities. Um, these are perches for the Falcons, so as you wait your turn, you know, there's 300 Falcons a day, you may have to wait in line. You just come out and tie your Falcon off, this is called a cash. I have one in the back of my car that my dad made, it's amazing. Um, and uh, this is actually, this is um, Sultan, um, this, is, this is the Sheik I was mentioning earlier who um, is largely responsible for, for modern falconry in UAE. So, He's very well liked, and there were several um, portraits of him around the Abu Dhabi Falcon Hospital. So, um, these are the different courses I took while I was there, and it was it was amazing. Uh, some of it I had a little basis in as a falconer, um, imping and coping of falcons. So that is maintenance of their talons and beak. Um, so and, and feathers. So if a falcon breaks their feathers, we save feathers from previous molts that they drop. So they drop all their feathers each year, and you save them in case they break a primary or a tail feather. And the feather shaft is hollow, so you can just slide, you can, you can make a new feather out of last year's feather. And that was one of the biggest things over there. I mean, as a falconer in the US, like I've, I've done imping, dad and I've done it, it's not a lot of fun. But they, they use anesthesia over there, and it's a breeze. It takes about 10 minutes, and it's great. And I'm so excited. I can't wait till I'm finally licensed as a veterinarian. It's gonna make my falconry a whole lot easier. <laughs> just put the bird under isofluorine, boom, we're good. Um, so very excited for that, because it was just standard practice. You just pick up falcon, boop, under anesthesia, you can fix all the feathers, examine the bird, it's great. Because they are certainly not like parrots, they don't enjoy being handled, they don't like being pet, um, they're still not domesticated um, by any sense of the word. So yeah, it was a very, very interesting um, courses. This is, this is our, the staff here. Um, I was lucky enough, there were four, in, or four interns while, there, while I was there, including myself. Um, this is a vet suit from Purdue. His name is Luai. Um, this is Alex from Germany. And over here we have um, an intern from Argentina. And he actually has been hired by uh, the, the Sultan I mentioned earlier as, the private, as a private veterinarian for his Falcons. Um, so it was pretty neat. And when I was visiting, I, I got to go through an invite from, from Willie, is his name. And um, he, the Sultan was very adamant about me staying on for another month. Like, you just stay, it's no problem. I'm like, just stay, you can work at my hospital and see how it goes. I was like, 
getting a job offer from a sultan. <laughs> um, it was very humbling, and very interesting. And I was like, let me graduate first. I said two more years. Um, but certainly a good contact to, to have. <laughs> yeah. So I hope he remembers me in two years. Um, that's another tangent. If, if I can, I can tell you more about my visit there after after the presentation. But um, so these are the different services they offer at, at the hospital, um, and it's everything from just your standard examination, your physical exam of the bird, to in, you know open open surgery, um, endoscopies. It, it, they it's they run the gambit. It's really amazing the the um, procedures they can do on falcons over there. Um, and I gained some great experience. I, I'm just now, I'll, I'll begin my third year um, of veterinary school and I'm just beginning surgery, but I already feel so much more confident in avian medicine, which is really a, a big specialty in the U.S. There's, there aren't terribly, there aren't too many veterinarians um, interested in avian medicine, so um, it's a niche I'm hopefully, hoping to um, venture into after I graduate. But this is a, a short video. Um, it's the organization of the, the feathers that they, for molting birds, they have, when the falcons come in, they put them under anesthesia, and they paint the primaries, the inside of the primaries, and the tail feathers uh, with a, a color-coded pattern. And they keep track of all these feathers that drop in the, the molting chambers um, so that they can know when the bird is done molting, and they can call so-and-so and say, hey, you're, it's been six months or so, your falcon's ready, please come pick him up, her up. Um, so this really just blew my mind. Each one of these bags represents a falcon that's in the molting chambers. Yeah, it's just a wall full of color-coded feathers. It was just amazing that there was a need for such organization. Um, I just thought that was really interesting. Um, these were some birds that um, had TB, and so of course they've got biosecurity practices in place TB. For, for TB, which was very interesting because I never we we don't see a lot of TB in the states for um, reasons of vaccinations, thankfully. Um, but when I was over there, I was like, "Your bird has TB. Like, well, shouldn't we, you know, put this bird down?" I was like, "No, it's like our daughter or son." I'm like, no, no, it's it's just so much different um, than than the practice we would have in the U.S. And I remember it was like during my first week, there was a bird on on the table draped, and there was a lesion, and I was examining it, and I was like, "Well, what is this?" And I'm like, "That's a TB lesion." And I was like. No one was going to tell me that that was like, I'm going to go wash my hands now. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was uh, very interesting to see how they, they handled all this. Um, this is a short video, again, on my cell phone, I apologize. But it's the, one of the molting chambers at the, at the facility, and there were something like 92 falcons in this room, <laughs> which, again, had me smiling. Um, but it was so large, and they have it, it, it for a good reason. Um, it's a dome-shaped circular building, so these falcons can fly laps. And they would have a stop actually, because so many of these falcons would be at the on the wing at once that it was wasn't uncommon for collisions to occur. So if one bird started flying against the current, so to speak, we would all just stop and sit down because we didn't want to stress or scare the bird and hopefully uh, prevent a, a collision. Um, so these are all uh, mostly jeer falcons back there, and I have some great pictures towards the end. Hopefully, if I don't run out of time. Um, the last portion of my presentation is mostly pictures of, of these incredible birds. Yeah. Again, here's a, a picture of the, of <coughs> the organization. Was, yeah. They literally had drawers of hundreds of feathers. They were all labeled. It would be primaries, white jeer falcon, primaries, black jeer falcon, primaries, hybrid, and, and for everything, for sacred falcons, peregrine falcons, <laughs> All of them. It was really <laughs> incredible, and I meant to bring Dr. Marsh back a uh, feather from a white year, but uh, I'll, I'll have to go back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here, I'm gonna, I'll get into the, the different species of falcons that are popular in, in the UAE. Um, here on the left, this is a, a big female white year falcon. Um, next to it, we have a hybrid. It's a jeer falcon, peregrine falcon hybrid. And their popularity emerges really from the combination of the size of the jeer falcon. It's the largest falcon in the world. They're enormous. They're bigger than our red-tailed hawks. Um, so the size and strength of the jeer falcon with the speed of the peregrine. So the peregrine is the fastest animal on the planet. Um, so you put the two together and you have a strong 
high flying, fast Falcon, and that's why they are so popular in the UAE for particularly for racing. Um, next to it, we have this is a Saker Falcon that is the national bird of the UAE. Um, I think I have some other pictures of Saker, so I won't go in there now. Next is another Jir Falcon or a Jir Hybrid, and the other is a Jir Hybrid as well. And you can see that no two hybrids look exactly alike. It was really interesting to see the variety um, in feather pattern, especially as, as a birder myself. It's just uh, whenever I have free time, I would just go sit on one of those perches next to a white Jir Falcon. Just try and find a way to get it home. <laughs> I like, Can I fit it in my carry-on? No. Um, so there's me again. I was like, before I leave, we had to take a picture because that's how they would transport all these falcons. They would bring some out for display because there were tour groups that came through twice a day at the Falcon Hospital, and so some of the birds were just out for for a display. And every day you would go to the wards, bring the birds out, give them medication, um, and uh, they carried them on these cages. And I was like, that. I need to do that at some point. That's pretty cool. Um, so here, this is a Sager Falcon. Um, it's on the national seal of the UAE. It's on all of their money. Um, it's their, it's the icon of the UAE, and it's one of their favorite species. But since the Jir Falcon, and since modern amenities like air conditioning and um, have made it possible to have Jir Falcons in the UAE, they have kind of taken the, the back seat. Um, so here is another sacred falcon. They look similar to a prairie falcon in the U.S. If we have any other birders in the room, this is this is for you, Dr. Marsh. This is the white the white jeer. Oh, that's a beautiful bird. Um, these the white jeers are native to Greenland and Iceland, and these are the birds that the kings and queens of old, like Norway, they would send ships with that specific purpose to bring back white jeer falcons. It just that's back when you know the sport of kings and everything. That was that was what they were going for. People, they used white jeers. Um, I was reading, I don't know historian, but there was a prisoner exchange during the Crusades that was solved. Um, they gave back some Spanish prince in exchange for a dozen white jeer falcons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so this is a, a white jeer, actually one that's molting. You can see the, some of the black feathers and the brown feathers. Um, make for a really beautiful pattern. Um, the brown will, will molt out and it'll be the black and white checkered um, pattern of the, the white gear. I, I fell in love with these birds. They were, that's on my bucket list one day. Um, I'll fly a white gear. So two more. And we, we also have, this is the black morph gear falcon. And this, oh, so white ones are beautiful, but the black gear falcons are spectacular. It's just, it's an it, it, a formidable falcon. They just look tough, and they're very strong, just very elegant. Um, and this this individual jeer falcon was the bird I did my final exam on. To, to get your certificate, you have to pass the final exam, and they give you a, a case that you have to do a diagnosis, a physical exam, uh, to collect samples and everything, and come up with a diagnosis, a prognosis, and a treatment plan all on your own. And so the day before, I was like, please, like, give me like the biggest jeer falcon you all have somebody with huge veins that won't have any troubles. Like, please don't bring me a little male peregrine. Like they're peacocks out on the grounds. Go get one of them. Um, but luckily, they gave me this beautiful deer falcon. Um, and I'll share a quick little anecdote. I know I'm, I'm running out of time here, but um, uh, the, the day after my exam, it was my last day there. I came in and I, I was watching the jeer that was that was perched out. Um, and this was the same bird that I had done my exam on. We, we had done endoscopies on both, so it was invasive. Um, we made incisions, and this was like my first you know, pseudo-surgery. Um, so I was very invested in this bird's continued health. Um, and so the next day I came out, and the bird was hooded, and it just kept, there was a little nystagmus going on. It just kept turning its head like this, and that can be a lot of different reasons. That can be like CNS damage, but it can also be that the hood doesn't fit particularly well, and it's itchy, and they're just turning. And so I walked over to the veterinarian, and I was like, hey, what's, what's going on? What, what's wrong with him? He goes, you did that. And then he walked out of the room, and he was joking with me, but my heart just dropped. Oh, my gosh. And it was so funny. It was after a month together, we, we had a really great relationship. It was a, it was a pretty cool staff. Um, so this is a, a hybrid, um, up close, uh, um, a Jeer Falcon Peregrine hybrid. And I, I explained the, the popularity there. Um, really cool, just very intricate pattern. Here again is another, these are two hybrids side by side. Um, and it was just a, a real privilege to, to be around these birds because they, they are the epitome of strength and speed and power. And um, I have always been enamored with 
falconry and birds of prey, but spending a month in the UAE uh, really gave me a newfound perspective as a veterinarian and as a falconer on these incredible birds. Um, and I, I hope to be able to, to go back at some point, um, maybe during the hunting season, um, and experience their their actual falconry and their style of hunting. So I'll have to call up my sultan for him and see if he'll have me back. But um, couldn't do a presentation without um, the crowd favorite. This is Vesper. Several people probably recognize her. She's the, the bird I grew up with out on Spring Island. Um, and she's now 10 years old and um, she's still still flying strong. So um, thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask me now or um, all through dinner or, or anything. So many hands, this is great. You were first. Thank you.